Welcome to the Orion X Download. This is a podcast where we discuss big ideas and big trends in high technology. Hello and welcome again to the Orion X Download. I'm Dan Olds here with my co-host Shaheen Khan. Hey Shaheen, how you doing? Excellent, Dano. How are you? Not bad. Uh, we are getting to our belated SC17 roundup. Well, we were going to do a preview, but uh, we probably at this point should do a post view. Yeah, I would go ahead and do the post view. I think uh, the time for the preview has come and gone. But we would sound so prophetic if we did a preview now. <laughs> oh, we would. We would sound very good. Um, and there were some interesting things that happened. One of the most interesting, I think, that got the most general press was China pulling ahead of the U.S. in the latest top 500 systems list. That's right. And not without a little bit of controversy, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, just to level set everybody, uh, just you know, half a year ago on the last list, the U.S. had 169 systems on it and China had 160. And now um, China has more. Way more, like 202. Yeah, and the U.S. has, I think, 143, and then followed by Japan, Germany, France, and the U.K., distant following. That's right. So what does this really mean? Uh, A lot of people painted this to mean that uh, the U.S. has fallen way behind in in HPC horsepower and in in, uh, world dominance of computing. Uh, What do you think? Well, I think there's a few things going on here. One is that uh, China is absolutely systematically investing in science and technology and supercomputing. They've been building their own uh, supercomputers. Increasingly, some some of the chips are indigenous. Uh, not 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 much of the software, but certainly at the hardware front, they're doing yeah. a lot more and more. Right. So, I think given that they are so systematically investing, when they are then ahead by as much as they are. Uh, there is a bit of a truth in there that you have to acknowledge. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of the systems that they counted are not really HPC systems. There's kind of a feel that they took any cluster and said, go out and run uh, Linpack on it, and if you got something that'll hit the 500 list, get it on the list. Yeah, and given that it was such a big jump, you have to assume that it was probably a little bit of a concerted effort. Uh, but... It's always been a bit of a, a, a controversy in top 500 whether the systems that you're counting are really doing HPC workloads, right? Yeah. If uh, you know if it's being used for transaction processing or data warehousing or whatnot, uh, those really don't qualify as HPC. So when you count them, it leaves a bad taste in people's mouth. But it does. On mind. the other hand, it could do it if you were to do it. So you know. In my mind, the rules allow it, and as long as the rules allow it, it's kind of hard to fault people for wanting to win based on the rules. True, but if you took, if you applied those same rules, and if the U.S. Uh, and others had the same intentions, uh, imagine what sort of uh, top 500 uh, placement Amazon and Google would have. They oh, would of own the entire list. Of course, absolutely. And and to the extent that they count them, that would be great. But of course, you know, many of our big sites really don't care whether or not they show up on the top 500. Yeah. Sometimes because they just don't care. Sometimes they don't want to go through the work. But absolutely, you know, if you take the cloud providers, uh, the U.S. would be way ahead. And for all I know, they could even beat the top performance right now. I would imagine if you took our exascalers that they could probably double or triple all of the performance on the list. You know, it's hard to imagine that people like, yeah, exactly. It's hard to imagine that folks like at Amazon and Google and IBM and Microsoft and these big cloud providers couldn't couldn't do a really good number if they put their mind to it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But in the meantime, number one still is a Chinese system as it was last time. Yep. And so is number two as well. Not much change in the top ten. A little bit. The one there from was Switzerland, the one. Uh, they doubled up their performance. I'm not going to pronounce this right. Pizdiant? Pizdiant, yeah, Pizdiant. I think. Pizdiant. 
uh, doubled up their performance by moving to uh, V100s. And so they got to the third spot. And Gyaiko so, from so Japan just... is a new entry at uh-huh. number four. And that beat out Titan. Right, 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 right. So the Swiss guys just upgraded their NVIDIA accelerators, GPUs. Yes. And that seems to be the the the, the, the uh, method of choice to get on the top 500 is to use these accelerators. Uh, and NVIDIA is a variety, and uh, this company, Pezzi, in Japan actually is showing up in the top 10. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, uh, the number one Taiyu Light system, I think, has its own architecture, so I don't think that one is... Not really an accelerator. Uh, yeah, exactly. I think each chip is its own kind of an accelerator looking thing yeah it it's kind of reminiscent of the old cell processor the cell right, broadband right. engine then there's, there's the green 500 and that's measuring performance per watt energy used and the number one system on that list is at Riken, the japanese institute this is a, a zeta scalar system made up of xeons and infinibands and the pezzi accelerator and that comes in at 17 gigaflops per watt then there's a HPC G benchmark, the conjugate gradient, which is trying to establish a bit of a lower bound on performance. Riken is again number one for that one with 0.6 petaflops, uh, basically 602 gigaflops. Mm-hmm. And then uh, there's another one called Graph 500, where you try to do some level of uh, graph analytics. And Riken again is number one in that. Hmm. Uh, so that also tells you something, is that uh, if you optimize for a more varied workload, you're probably going to have to give up a little bit of top 500 to do so, and and Riken is doing it. And that's, uh, that's, that's really, that's the case, Supercomputer, if I'm not mistaken. So that's really, really nice, yeah. Uh, the vendor rankings have changed a fair amount in the top 500. IBM, or well, first, led the overall broad... Uh, measure 94.2 percent of the total said number of 500 systems are now using intel processors which is slightly up from 92.8 but i'd call that a pretty healthy market share yeah definitely definitely and ibm power processors are next at 14 systems which is down from 21 systems as some of these old uh, systems come off the list Mm -hmm. Of course, IBM took a big hit when they sold their x86 business yeah. to Lenovo. So at this point, all of their entries are the power architecture, and they're 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 trying to build that back up. And HP HPE has a lead in the total number of installed supercomputers at 122, nearly 25 percent. Uh, Lenovo follows with 81 systems. Uh, Inspur is rising up with 56 systems. Cray now has 53 systems, which is four down from where they were six months ago. And still very impressive, given that yeah. they're the smallest player at this point. Uh, Sugon came up, and, you know, in general, the Chinese vendors came up mm-hmm. uh, with Lenovo breaking that trend down a few systems. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I want to I add that I just looked it up, and the Riken system is indeed number 10 on the top 500. And and uh, and it is a Fujitsu uh, K supercomputer, which is a Spark 64. And that's been around for a while. It's been around for a while. That's right. And it's held up really well, especially as number one for three of the, uh, the four benchmarks. So what else happened at SC17? Oh, let's see. We had a lot of news that came out about various things, one of which is uh, Oak Ridge is getting ready to... Uh, Push out the Summit supercomputer for 2018. And what I hear in the rumor mill is that they're delivering as quickly as humanly possible. And that that is going to be, uh, Summit is going to be around 200 petaflops when completed next summer. So that will make it the biggest system in the world. Unless it's Unless something by... else comes. Yeah. <laughs> right. So next year would be really exciting. Now, what is the architecture of the Summit? Uh, IBM Power. Power. Now, IBM was, uh, I think, previewing on their NDA at, during SC17 their Power 9 system, which has since been announced. Yes. Yes. And that's a pretty formidable chip and a pretty Very formidable so. system. Uh, they're gearing it uh, really hard, pushing it really hard for AI, which I think um, 
I wouldn't want customers to be confused and think that this is just an AI system because it's a, a damn good general processing system, particularly if you have anything that's accelerated. Right, right. But, you know, I understand that. I think in general, if you look at what IBM is doing with, uh, with AI, with Watson, with data science, with, uh, you know, DSX and SPSS, and what they're doing with, I mean, analytics, they've been driving that for more than a decade now. Yeah. Uh, and with uh, basically cognitive computing, as, they, as they've termed it, with cloud, with, which is kind of part of the soft layer strategy, uh, and then while they're doing that, they're pushing on quantum computing, and we're going to come back to that later. Uh, you know, that, 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 if you think of it as like that, then it makes sense that they would position this strongly for AI. It does, but I think that this is a, a general HPC high-end enterprise system that by, by pushing it too hard for AI, if they do that, that they are um, limiting its market. Yeah, I don't know. I think that you have to pick your sweet spot and then trust the customers to go around it as, as they would. And I think... You know, if you reverse engineer their thinking, it seems like they figure if they position it for AI, all the HPC stuff will happen anyway. Well, maybe I would rather position it. If it were me, I would position it for as many markets as it's suitable for, and let the customers figure out where it should go. Yeah, where they well, want it in their in their infrastructure. There's also something to be said about focus, and this will provide that. So we shall see, as they say, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, other chip news, uh, Intel has formally um, said that the Knights Hill uh, set of processors are dead. They basically rearranged their roadmap a little bit, didn't they? They did. They did. And um, I kind of liked I kind of liked what they did. I think that what they did was to say, good. yeah, they said that, hey, you know, instead of trying to push to get something at this time, maybe we can give ourselves another year and come with something that is way better. Well, I always felt that the biggest competitor for their their Knights product line, uh, the Phi product line, was Xeon. And as Xeons get better and better and better, the gap between those two becomes narrower. Mm-hmm. And I think putting all of your wood behind the arrow, as Scott McNeely would say, um, in favor of Xeon is probably the right move. And that doesn't mean that they can't do other accelerator type chips or massive core count type chips. It just means that they won't be doing this one anymore. I see. I see. Well, I, 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 I don't doubt that they will continue to do a great job with Xeon. Mm-hmm. That, that is obviously the, the bloodstream of computing today. Well, yeah, and, it's only 94.2% of everything on the top 500 yeah. list, for example. <laughs> exactly. It's a, it's a healthy market share. <laughs> exactly. So Intel can look at their installed base and basically look at the whole market. Essentially, yes. Yeah. So, and, and many, many of those really aren't high-end in, you know, AI and accelerators and this, that, and the other. So I'm sure they will continue to do a great job there. On the other hand, between AI and and, and blockchain and cryptography and cybersecurity, there's a lot of opportunities to rethink how you're going to design these chips. And I think there's, a, there's, a, there's something to be said for doing that. And I believe that's what they're doing as well. Mm. Mm-hmm. But that takes us to another big chip uh, event, and that's uh, the emergence of ARM. True. So ARM has been talking about getting into the server world for a number of years now. And this year was the first year I saw some tangible, credible moves that makes it uh, pretty apparent that ARM and servers are going to happen. It's a, it's a reality. Uh, how much of that is because of technology is a little bit a question mark to me. I don't think they're doing that by some black and white evidence that makes them superior to Intel. I don't really see any of that. There are some minor things here and there, and over time they might be able to do this. But, uh, but I think uh, a lot of it is more because uh, customers want an alternative, and uh, ARM chip providers are starting to get there. So that includes uh, Cavium with their Thunder X2 processor, which I believe is leading in the market there, and they're doing a very good job. And they signed up Cray as a as a system vendor, which I think is very very 
uh, credible. Uh, HPE also talked about ARM, but they've been talking about ARM for years and really not yeah, shipping much. They've done a little bit, but I don't think the demand was there. Well, okay, but uh, but my point is that the, 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 the Cray announcement I take as a little bit more weighty yes. than the HPE one. Well, that's for a specific <clears throat> system as well. That's right, that's right, that's right. And then Qualcomm is the other uh, player there that they just showed up with their Centrique 2400 CPU. And that's the first server CPU that is using a 10 nanometer uh, feature size in their in their uh, fabrication, uh, which obviously gives it a nice boost. Uh, but see, really nothing that Intel can't match. Give it another six months to a year or something. Yeah, I'd really like to see benchmarks on that one. Yeah, now... And what, some more what, details. Yeah, what I'm seeing is that... Uh, Qualcomm is really focused on cloud providers. So it's really optimized for single socket boards, just rack and stack them. And, uh, and, and that may not be a bad way of doing it. Webby, right? webby kind of workloads and things like that, transaction processing. I think that makes sense. That's right. I mean, they've talked about Google as a, as a, as a customer. Uh, so has IBM with Power9, by the way. Yep. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the next player is Applied Micro, with their X-Gene 3 processor, which they talked about way back last March, and uh, they would be shipping them uh, by now. Mm -hmm. So more and more players starting to be a little bit credible. Uh, and I believe it's happening not for technology reasons, but for business reasons. Interesting. You know, I, I see the Cavium processor as being a real player looking over the specs of this. They've released the most information uh, this thing's got 132 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth versus 98 for um, Intel Sandy Lake. You yep. can put a whole bunch of memory, up to 16 DIMMs per socket, on this thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As, I think they are they are leading in this market right now, if you ask me. Yeah, I think you're right. So what else happened? So the other thing that I saw a lot of was liquid cooling. Mm -hmm. uh, back in SC16, the year before, there was a whole bunch of liquid cooling on the floor and, uh, you know, it was starting to emerge. Our colleague Steve Campbell wrote a whole big paper about it on HPC Wire uh, that was pretty well received uh, and has a whole table of all the players there. Uh, SC17, I saw more of them and I saw them showing up in more booths. Mm -hmm. uh, other, other, other system vendors were starting to show their liquid cooling systems. Uh, the leaders there are, in my mind, uh, Cool IT and sure. Ace Attack. Uh, and of course, you know, 3M is a big player there for... For the immersive immer side, for yeah. For immersive stuff, it's yeah. a lot for of 3M stuff on the floor. Yeah, yeah. And it's, so, you know, it's funny, it's been a long time coming. The first time I saw 3M on this uh, stuff was um, 2009 in Portland. When they came, yeah, right. Now, so, so the history of it with 3M is the Cray 2 supercomputer way back when that had the floor inert fluid and Seymour designed the waterfalls uh, design. So the boards were immersed and the fluid would be pumped up and then poured over this ledge. Yes. And it was just a beautiful system. And of course, if the you're waterfall, buying it, The waterfall system. The waterfall system. So if you're spending $35 million for a system, that's a pretty good thing to have. Uh, and then they kind of went away, and then they came back recently, like you're saying, uh, starting 2009. Well, you didn't need them. I mean, that you didn't was need the them. thing. That's right. Uh, that's right. Once the bipolar chips went away, um, the heat came way down with modern microprocessors, and you just didn't, uh, you didn't need it. Yeah, but you're right. now you do. Uh, yeah, now it's all the density. And if you want to pack them, you don't have to take the heat out. One other thing uh, happened that was interesting is quantum computing. Uh, we mentioned earlier that uh, IBM is getting into that, and of course they're 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 one of the promising players there. Uh, they had uh, new systems with uh, a prototype with something like 50 qubits. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're so they're marching forward. Uh, D-Wave continues to be the leader in that market. They announced a sale to Toyota. Uh, Volkswagen had also bought one of their systems earlier. Uh, the Toyota system is uh, keeping track of uh, uh, a lot of, it's basically a bunch of IoT data. You know, they're keeping track of all the, you know, 
taxis and cars and such. Of all the data uh, coming off of those? Yeah, yeah. And I don't exactly know what the real application is, but uh, there is a bit more information on that system coming out just about now. Well, it's got to be something along the lines of of um, putting all that data together and pulling some some real, some usable data out of it, some usable conclusions out of it, because I don't think you'd buy something like that as a collection repository. Well, I think there are maybe two categories of buyers for quantum computers right now. One is obviously the classified work mm-hmm. uh, and the imperative that you need to keep track of the sort of tools that might be available. And then the second are the people who really see that as an important thing in the future and have the wherewithal to start experimenting with it. Mm. And that's people like Google and Volkswagen and Toyota. and That makes sense. And then, of course, you've got the research institutions. Uh, if, you, if you look at who's all doing it, obviously, there's IBM, there is D-Wave in Canada, there is Rigetti out of you know, Berkeley, California. Uh, then there is Chinese Academy of Sciences. There is uh, Microsoft. Uh, Google has its own uh, project in there. Well, Google's got their feet in a couple of camps. Basically, any camp you can think of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you're Google. You need to be there. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Now, the other thing that is nice is that these quantum computers are starting to look like coprocessors for actual supercomputers. That make that that usage model makes a lot of sense to me, because you're going to really need does. this thing to be surrounded by some serious iron in order to feed it. Exactly. Exactly. Now, the whole thing is really early days, and, and a lot of progress is happening really fast. Uh, obviously, because quantum computers are really good at uh, optimization and figuring out, going through you know, billions of possibilities and finding the one with the lowest energy, uh, it is leading to a few buzzwords that, that, that we should cover. One is uh, Y2K, Y2Q, Y2Q. <laughs> and what does that mean? <laughs> Y2Q is years to quantum. Ah, years to How many to years are we quantum. away from true quantum? Yeah. The next buzzword is quantum supremacy, and that's when quantum computers are faster than uh, traditional computers, and that's not the case today. And then the third one is uh, quantum safe cryptography. Ah, I'd be uh, interested in that. Yeah, so the idea is that with quantum computers, you can crack all the codes that traditional computers can't, And uh, can you come up with safely encrypting things that are uh, immune from uh, quantum computers? So that has led to a big branch of technology and research called uh, quantum safe cryptography. It's been going on for years, by the way. The University of Stuttgart, uh, University of Illinois, a bunch of other places around the world have been doing doing research in it. whole, Whole books have been written about it. But it is starting to become noticed in a big way. Very interesting stuff. It was a great uh, event, well attended. I haven't heard the attendance numbers, but I would imagine, at least to me, it looked like this might have broken a record. I thought so, too. But uh, great stuff, and we, you're right, we probably should have done this as a preview, then we would be looking astonishingly prophetic. <laughs> but at least we got our wrap-up done. We and did, we're still we in the same calendar year as SC. So I'm going to call that a win. (laughs) It's a huge win. So thank you very much, uh, Shaheen, and thank you everybody for listening, and we'll be back at you again soon with another Orion X download.